Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to Dr. John Wooten. He's from the University of Southern Mississippi, an old friend of mine. And we've been uh, working and doing different things together at his school and really happy to have him over at UNO today. He's got a wealth of information about this instrument, the steel pans, and uh, other percussion instruments that go along with uh, calypso and soca music, and he knows a lot about the history of Trinidad, too, so I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to start this thing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you don't have any, any questions, you know, help me out. Get me, get me going, but... Tell you what, why don't we? I got a question. Yeah, what? How long have you been playing this instrument? I first started playing pans in 1994. How'd you uh, get into it? Uh, actually, when I was at North Texas, uh, they had a they had a big steel band there, and that's where I saw Ellie Manette, the the guy that. So I'll give you a little history. This since we started this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ellie Manette is the person that created the first uh, steel pan out of a 55 gallon barrel in 1946, so he, he basically invented the instrument. Where was he from? Trinidad. This instrument's from Trinidad. And um, uh, he, he lives in the United States now. He has since the late 50s. He's been living in the United States, actually moved to Brooklyn. And if you know where Andy Norell is, you've heard of Andy Norell. His father was a social worker, and he worked with uh, the youth in Brooklyn. And he heard about the steel bands in Trinidad and how these uh, the gangs in Trinidad were they were using uh, the steel drums and they were musical ensembles competing against each other. So they turned in these youth gangs into musical organizations, and now they're highly respected musical organizations, very well organized. But they started out as gangs. That's why they have they have names like the Renegades, Desperados, <laughs> Exodus. Invaders. His his band was Invaders from Woodbrook, which is a, a suburb of Port of Spain, Trinidad. And uh, so they brought him up to the United States. And at the time in in Trinidad, it was very oppressive, and he wasn't allowed to to do what he wanted. In fact, the government would come in and take the instruments. Basically, he'd steal the the material from the Navy base that was there, the U.S. <laughs> Navy base. He'd steal the the pans from the Navy base. Of course, they weren't using them. But, and he'd make instruments, and then the government would come in and destroy his instruments, and he'd have to start over, and it's just a lot of that sort of thing going on. So he's the first one that actually made, physically made the instrument yep. from, a, from a steel drum. That's right, in wow. 1946, mm -hmm. which is what, 1946? Uh, it's like 58 years ago, too. Yeah, but what's, what's significant about 1946? World War II. End of World War II, the end of World War II. And it's the first year that they were allowed to parade during Carnival. There's lots of Catholics. It's a British colony, there's lots of Catholics. In China, and wherever you find large Catholic population, you have Carnival. Here we have Mardi Gras, it's Carnival. You know, and uh, it's a, obviously pre Lenten season, right? Where you, Car Carnival actually comes from the word carni, meat, meat. and va, go. Meat goes. Carnival, meat goes. Mm -hmm. So you have to eat all the meat because you're not allowed to eat meat for 40 days. If you don't eat it, it's going to spoil. Mm -hmm. So that's where carnival comes from. Carnival comes from. Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday, right? You eat because Wednesday you can't eat. <laughs> so, um, but they were allowed to parade that carnival season, and that's when this instrument was introduced during carnival season in 1946. And he's still around. He's uh, 88. Okay. He was 17 years old when he... It just, can you imagine? Wow. They used to march with steel pans? Yeah, they have what they call, they still do. They have uh, what they call pan around the neck bands. In Trinidad, you know, during carnival season, you can see them in other places too, but of course in Trinidad, it's the land of the steel pan. So uh, they have pan around the neck, so you'll see bands, you know, pan around the neck. And the bass, you know, they can only, the, the pan around the neck bands can only play in, uh, you know, one or two keys though because they take the bass pans, you know, the bass pans, and they put them on wheels. But the bass pan's only three notes. Each pan, which is a full barrel, it's only three notes. So if they're going along, they call it the boom boom. They just have like a, a root, fourth, and fifth. A one, four, five on one pan, just the root. So, uh, you know, they can play 
a limited amount of stuff. But um, are these chromatic? Uh, these are fully chromatic. Uh, now, Ellie Manette actually made these. Uh -huh. These are made by Ellie Manette. Uh -huh. And I saw, to get back to your question, I saw him tuning uh, the pans at North Texas. He came over it, and I was just super fascinated by it. It blew me just to watch him tune the drums. And I was just, I'd just sit there for hours just watching it. And he'd tell stories, and it was the most intriguing thing. Of course, when he tells stories, this is Ellie Manette, the guy that invented the steel drum. He invented the only acoustic chromatic instrument of the 20th century that's, that has survived and is successful in use. That's pretty crazy. And how does he tune it? Are you like just bending the metal? Or, or? Yeah, yeah, with one of these. Hammer. <laughs> The hammer. I'm not going to hit on these because I'll mess them up. But uh, each one is uh, each dent is a, is a pitch, as you can see. Each one of these. And of course, the smaller, the higher the pitch. And this is um, these are called double seconds. This is the alto voice of the steel band. This double seconds. Because this is like the second voice and there's two pans, we call them double seconds. Uh, but it's the, it's the alto voice. And it's basically the same range as, as that vibraphone. I have a low E, I have another half step past that. But it's basically the same exact range as that vibraphone. And uh, the lead pan is one pan, and its lowest note is middle C. That's like, they actually call that tenor pan. But it's not the tenor voice, they call it tenor pan because it was the first one they made. And when they made, when he made a tenor pan, see, they were banging on little cans. They were banging on little cans and, and biscuit tins where they got like three or four pitches. And then when he made this big drum, they called it the big drum. It was just out of a 55 gallon barrel. It went down to middle C, so they called it a tenor pan because it went so low. But later on, it became the high, it became the soprano part of the steel band. But people still call it tenor pan. People, people call it tenor pan all the time. You heard uh, Dylan Muller now? Oh yeah, he plays a tenor pan. Yeah, great player. Um, actually, he probably plays all the pans, but when I've heard him, he plays the yeah. lead pan. Bad dude, yeah, bad dude. Um, so that's how I got into it. So I saw him and I said, man, someday I want to learn how to play steel, steel pen. And believe it or not, when I was at North Texas, I didn't study a lot of jazz, unfortunately. There's a couple of things, that, that place was, I was I was busy every day and night I was there, and then there's a lot of stuff I just get, didn't get to do. I played in one of the reading bands on drum set, but I taught the drum line, and I played in the orchestra and the wind ensemble, and I was you know, a graduate assistant in the, in the percussion studio. So, and I taught the drum line. That took up most of my time. <laughs> what did you say was different about the tenor pan again? Different about the tenor pan? Well, it's just it's a it's, it's one pan. It's fully chromatic. Now it's it's tuned in the circle of fourths. It is depending on which way you go. But it's one pan and it's fully chromatic in itself. I'll, I'll get to these other voices in a minute. Tell you how they're all tuned. But each each voice in the steel band is different. So just because you play one doesn't mean you can play the other one. It's totally different. It's a different instrument. It's the tuning. Like the, the layout of the notes. Yeah, it's the, tuning, the tuning scheme is different. So a lead pan has all the notes, or a tenor pan, lead pan, call it, uh, has all the notes right there. So it's like C's here, C sharp. A chromatic scale would be like this. But it's C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, so forth. Or C, G, D, that way. Going around fifths or fourths. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so that's the way this one, this one is the uh, alto voice, which is double seconds, and this is a whole tone scale, and a whole tone scale over here. So you had two whole tone scales, and between the two whole tone scales, obviously you have a chromatic scale, right? <laughs> My chromatic scale is left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. shouldn't tell you all this because chromatic scales for me are easy. <laughs> yeah. So when I play one, people go, whoa, that was cool. I'm going, that's the easiest thing I did all night. <laughs> Diatonic scales for me are hard because it's going to be three and right, right. 
three and one here. One's tuned in, in, in whole steps. Whole steps. Half, step 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 step. half step apart. Half step apart. Wow, interesting. Two whole tones. Now, the next voice down is the guitar pans, and there's three of those. And you have three diminished seven chords, and that's how they're tuned. Wow. Right? How many diminished seven chords are there? Two, three. One, two, three. So if you have a chromatic scale, how many, how many whole tone scales are there? Two. 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 One, two. So that's. And then the bass pans are tuned in, in fifths. So you have the F and C, G and D, you know, E flat and B flat in one pan. But there's only three notes per pan. So we need six of those to get like an octave and a half. And that's, that's, that's what's crazy. So when we move the steel band, we have, like the steel pan orchestra at Southern Miss, we have four bass players. So to move the whole band, we, we need a huge truck just to move so the base. Save us that semi. Yeah. <laughs> actually, we're coming. Actually, we're playing, if, if you can, we're playing in New Orleans in the French Quarter at lunch Thursday, and then at NOCA Thursday afternoon, and at Brother Martin Friday morning, which is right down the road, right? At 11 o'clock, you want to come by Brother Martin, see that it's a 28 piece steel pan orchestra. Wow. Whoa. Hey. It, would, it would pretty much fill this room close. <laughs> Or half the room. Wow. Half the room. Yeah. So we have six sets of these, not nine lead pans, six of these, uh, two guitar pans, two cello pans, a tenor bass, and three six bass. So and then full, and then what we call the engine room. So anyway, back to this store, I keep getting off track. I saw, you know, I saw Ellie Minette at North Texas and I said one day I want to learn how to play. And I went to, I did my doctorate at the University of Iowa and I took for Tom Davis who was a really good jazz vibraphone player. He's, I don't know if you've ever heard of Tom Davis, but he, he grew up in, New, in uh, Chicago with, with Gary Burton with the Dick Shorey ensemble. And uh, so he's a really good player. He kind of got overshadowed by Gary Burton, I think. All five players got overshadowed by the <laughs> But uh, anyway, he taught at the University of Iowa, and I took from him, and I just basically took this, what he showed me on vibes and, and adapted it to steel pan. When I got to Southern Miss, first thing I wanted to do was, was get, get uh, some steel drums and, and got these. So we got uh, we started with a small band, like four voices. That's it, and it's grown to 30 people in all. Wow. So, yeah. And um, it's amazing that you have that many uh, <coughs> students that are inter interested. Well, I'll tell you what, <coughs> um, I got like almost 30 percussion majors in Southern mm -hmm. Miss, um, and uh, seven grad students. And what I do, what, over the, I've learned as I've, as I've gone on, you know, some, some people, some non-majors would want to get in the band and they'd play. Sometimes they were the best students because they were just thrilled to be there mm -hmm. so they practice more than the percussion majors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the percussion, what I found was the percussion majors, the ones that were in the steel band, come audition time for sight reading and everything, they kicked everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. Because in the steel band we read constantly mm -hmm. and we improvise. It's like, a, it's, it's like our jazz band mm -hmm. for percussionists. Mm -hmm. You know, in, the, in percussion ensemble we're doing a lot of other things. You know, doing a lot of reading on keyboards and stuff, but not as much as you do in steel band. We're reading a lot of literature. And I found that those guys just read so much better after being in the steel band than everybody else. I required freshmen and sophomore to be in the steel band. So I required <coughs> freshmen and sophomore to be in the steel band, and once they play in it for two years, they're hooked. <laughs> they're in it for four years. So then we get pretty much 100% participation in the percussion studio with the steel mm -hmm. band now. Wow. And we do have some other, and we have a beginner band, so we have different levels <coughs> too, so. Um, <coughs> tell you what, let's, and then, and then, so we talked about all the, the different voices. There's actually nine different voices in the steel band. <coughs> um, and, and you play this just like everybody thinks, you know, first of all, people come up to me all, all the time and say, Man, play those Jamaica drums for me. <laughs> and I go, man, you give me a $20 bill, I'll do whatever you want me to, but they're not, 
you know, they're not from Jamaica and they're not drums. <laughs> These are not drums. These are, this is, this is the, actually the instrument this is mostly uh, closely related to uh, is the vibraphone. It's tuned metal. It's an idiophone, not a membranophone. And uh, it's the same range and it's tuned metal. At least this voice is. And I play this voice because I sing a lot. You know, I do gigs. I go to the casinos on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and sometimes five hour gigs <laughs> by myself. Wow. You know, and I sing a lot of tunes. So, and this I can play down low. See trees of cream, red roses too. I see them blue for me and for you. And I think to myself. Sharp five. <laughs> what scale do you play with a sharp five? Well, time. <laughs> I love, man, when I see sharp five, I just go, uh -uh. I'm licking my chops on a sharp five. So, because I can just play a whole tone scale. I guess it's like any instrument, you know, any instrument, some things are easier to do than others. So, play. But, um, so I do a lot of that where I sing and play, and this is a great range for me. And I don't want three barrels, you know. I mean, go to the guitar pans, which is a lower range, but I got to carry three barrels, and they're bigger, so it just becomes cumbersome. The lead pan is different, so yeah. But that's why. Well, that's a long answer for a simple <laughs> question. Yeah. Okay, so let's play. Um, let, I'm going to talk about the engine room and all the all the in, in Trinidad. You know, of course, the way a lot of this got started. Is uh, it's just these are African Trinidadians, and they just got they played whatever they could get their hands on. So this instrument, of course, was it was junk. This was discarded junk, and they made they're making beautiful instruments out of it. It's just freaking awesome. So, and then everything else in the what they call the engine room is also junk. We got this is this is really where the brake drum comes from. And then they start. You start seeing the brake drum used in all kinds of percussion literature. But it, you know, it started out in Trinidad. They were banging on it. That's a, that's hey. a big brake brake drum. What kind of car did that? I don't know. It's a big, it's a, okay, so. Typical brake drum rhythm where you, the E's and U's are emphasized and the downbeat was de-emphasized. So that's a typical brake drum rhythm, but you also have things like a whole blade. You know. So a lot of metal sounds, you know, they had cowbells and of course triangles and hands with rocks in it. Is your whole blade is sharp five, did you know that? Sure. <laughs> At least from here it is. <laughs> and kind of close. Um, I guess it depends on what key you're in. You said the steel pads read better? Huh? The steel pad players read better? Yeah, because just because we do a lot of literature. So they be their note recognition. They transfer that to other instruments. And it doesn't really matter. They they just read a lot better and they do better in auditions. So I've just found that all my pan players did better, so I'd require them to play. Uh, so we're gonna, can why, we jam? Why did you do so much better? Because they read all the time. They're constantly reading. He's not saying that, he's not saying that just because they played steel pans. No. They read better, it's because it's constantly shedding makes you better at yeah. whatever you're doing. I got a secret to being a good reader. Got the secret. No, I need to know that. <laughs> Here it is, you ready? Yeah. Read. read. To it. <laughs> that's it. That's the secret. Sorry, it's not. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. The more you read, the better you get at it. So, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna create a little groove here. I think we probably have enough for everybody to play. Wow. Right. So if I need somebody to hold down the fort, I'm gonna start with this. Just. And you can do the same thing here, but go. He's going to be one E and a two E and a nineteen. There you go. 
Right here is yeah, take us on the road, man. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Man. That's a yeah. shaker, man. I like this shaker. A little softer. <laughs> So that's, that's the engine room. Oh, man, that was nice. It's kind of, I love playing in the engine room. We play these tunes that sometimes just groove for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. And I just, some of my students, I don't want to play in the engine room, man. That's that's for flunkies or something. I want, you know, I said, let me do it. <laughs> I love just sitting, are you kidding me? I get to sit back there and look around. And, yeah. and, it, and it just feels so good. That felt good. I think for not non-drummers, man, that's 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 that takes a lot of concentration just to keep one thing going for an extended period of time. You, you know, this right? instrument right here is the hardest instrument oh, yeah. I've ever recorded. Yeah, this one right here, the most difficult instrument to record because hmm. you screw up, man. You can't, you know, splice it. Yeah, <laughs> you got to start. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the slower tempos like that. Yeah. You got the, the problem is a lot of people they, they go down. Just think of it, keep it horizontal. And if you want a big motion, you just make a big you, uh, an accent. You make a big motion. So, with that Brazilian kind of swing. Yeah. Okay. Double time. <laughs> it's not a shaker clinic. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> it's no. not an LP clinic either. Sec second, <laughs> no, it's second, second uh, um, most difficult instrument is that triangle. It's for the same reason, just keeping yeah. it time and steady. Yeah. Like, man. Actually, sometimes when you screw up here, you know, if I screw up on a. Oh, my God. That's it can it can actually sound good. Mm -hmm. Sometimes an accident sounds good. In fact, a lot of times an accident sounds good because I pretend to play too much. Because I know that old saying: if you screw up, do it again, and it sounds like you did it on purpose. I do that. I do that often. I do that often, sure. But I I'm sure you teach the same thing: is we don't have to take breaths. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, with percussionists, I find that that's the one thing. I said, man, y'all need to hang out with some saxophone players. And learn how to phrase because we can just keep playing. Mm -hmm. My piano player, one time I remember years ago, it kind of stuck in my head because we were learning this tune and I was just trying to learn the changes. So I was learning the changes, so I was like playing everything because I wanted I wanted to know the changes. So he stopped. He goes, "Do you have to play every note?" <laughs> like, yes, I do. Because <laughs> I can't. <laughs> But that's, that kind of stuff with me. Like, I, don't, I know what you mean. Don't, I mean, don't you find when you're listening to someone that's inexperienced, uh, uh, like a pianist, and somebody in a rhythm section that can play all the time and yeah. do, that uh, becomes very boring? It does become quite boring. Because there's no boring. space in the There's music. no space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. No. And listen, and sometimes I, um, you know, listening to a pianist that does play with space, they kind of stand out. It's like, wow. So, no, I mean, for me, part of the, the genius of certain players is where they decide to start things and where they decide to stop. So, oh, I would never thought of starting that phrase there, you know. I mean, yep. exact, a prime example is Charlie Parker. When he came on the scene at, at that time, people were not used to hearing horn players start certain phrases in, in the places he was starting them. And he would, he would cause drummers to flip the time. I'm still not used to hearing <laughs> Some of the stuff. Yes. But um, yeah, so it's a good lesson to, to play with other other instrumentalists. I guess no matter who you are, play with other players. Because ten, I don't know about what it's like here, but my students, are, you know, they're all percussionists. They tend to hang out with each other. So y'all need to break up, man. Y'all can't all play in the same band when you leave here. Y'all gonna have to find, you know, somebody, other human beings with other instruments to play with, not just percussions. You know, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, any questions so far? Really, I know. I know. Also, I mean, this is off the track, but I know you're you're this virtuoso drummer too, snare drummer. You know that. Uh, I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? And 
or um, I don't know if that's you prepared to do that today, but, but, but no. But um, yeah. I mean, if you're interested, I mean, how many of you are percussionists? Okay. Yeah, my I guess my two areas of specialty. My one area is rudimental drumming. You know, I did a lot of drum course stuff. Actually, my teacher is from New Orleans, Marty Hurley, and uh, who was one of the greatest rudimental percussion educators ever, pretty much. <laughs> and uh, but um, I get, you know what you can do. There's a lot of there's a lot on the on the on the internet. There's a there's an app. If you don't have the Big Firth Rudimental app, you can go go get it. It's free, and you can watch tons of video about learning. You know the rudiments. I mean, until you're blue in the face, really. Uh, but it looks like that. The Big Firth Rudiment app, and then. Uh, there's a lesson on every rudiment, and there's lots of stuff on this site uh, on licks and but um, rudiments. Now, my philosophy with rudiments, you know, rudimental players, a lot of rudimental players, a lot of my friends that are rudimental players give rudimental drumming a bad rap. And that's, in fact, um, well, with, with this thing before I, before I go on with that story, each root you have a rudiment, all the twelve, I mean, all the forty rudiments. PAS rudiments are on here, and you got a video of some drum set guy or a drum corps or your Steve Gadd. You know the few rudiments. Steve mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Kenny Arnold. Uh, and there's a video of him, but then the, over here there's a lesson. You got tracks you can play along, and then you got videos of a lesson, and then the rudiment breakdown. And all these videos are of me giving a lesson on each rudiment, and then so forth. But my. How do you find it? Just go, just go to the app store and look up Big Firth Rudiment app, and then there's a there's a video, yours truly, <laughs> giving a lesson on, you know. And there's some other stuff like ridiculous licks, you know, and stuff that you would just if you just want, you know, rudiment candy. That's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of visuals and stuff like that. How do you go to the app store? The app store on your on your smartphone or yeah, your yeah, it's on, you have to have that iPhone. Yeah, so yeah. Well, you can, can get it on any. Oh, you can. Yeah, it's, it, it's on, you can get it on Android. Any. Google it would be a Google Play Store. Android. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I go all over the world actually doing that. Wow, which is kind of cool. That is cool. You know, and, and you developed the app. You, yourself, no, or Mark or Wessels you? developed the app, yeah. and uh, you know he just. Uh, he, in fact, he does the whole Big Firth website, which is, if you ever check out the Big Firth website, it's it's the most intense, uh, it's the best educational, it won some awards recently about the best, it's the most uh, percussion education site on the internet, by mm -hmm. far, actually. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about how big Big Firth is, the company is pretty, oh, yeah. pretty sure. large. I think yeah. it's 38 million a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and Vic is a, just, uh, he's just a, a righteous dude. He puts a lot of money into education. Huh. Yeah, he's yeah. very. Uh, I yeah. met him for like five minutes one time at a NAM. And uh -huh. He was just. He talked about how uh, he had like he had like thirty private students of his own. Yeah, he's and he's he's like pretty outstanding guy. He's eight. He's eighty-eight now. Oh, man. He's eighty-eight. And the thing is, <laughs> he's eighty-eight. He still goes to the NAM show. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He loves it. PAS. He loves it. He yeah. loves being around that environment and everything. Yeah. So what are you doing here? Huh. <laughs> All the money you got. He's looking at the register. Ching 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 ching. Yeah. Because he loves it, and this is what he does. And he loves watching people. And he loves something, it. something music merchants, something. It's like we're National all. Association of Music Merchandisers. Yeah. Uh, it's like for. Like, it's, it's a big. It's like a big conference for yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. He's and, famous uh, for creating drumsticks. Hmm? He's yeah. famous for creating drumsticks. Right. Yeah, he was a he was a he was a timpanist in the Boston Symphony for fifty years, and he developed his own sticks and timpani sticks, timpani mallets. Now it's like this huge biggest drumstick company ever. Yeah, yeah, largest. We were talking about actually they uh, they were telling me their the, the sales of their five A stick, just the five A, which is the most popular stick, which is about. 18% of their total sales. 
just the sales of the 5A is larger than any other drumstick company in the world. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> yeah, a lot of trees. Yeah, it's a lot of trees. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of trees. Well, just uh, you, were, you were saying that you know when you have all your drum students together, man, you got to got to hang out with saxophone players. I was tell the non-drummers that they didn't hang out with drummers and learn how. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, just I learn some things, ways. especially in jazz. I mean, I think it's just yeah, important no, for I told, I told non-drummers to learn that too. Yeah, so you, know. you need to hang out with some drummers because your timing is really horrible. Right, right. Yeah. How do you how do you work on someone's timing, or how do you I, if someone doesn't have a good what I call a clock? You know, is it, you work with metronomes, or is there anything? You know, well, is there anything you know secrets you have in that department? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. Here's what I found with, with metronomes. Yes, metronomes. But you like listening to a metronome? Mm -hmm. I hate listening to a metronome. Mm -hmm. Playing with tracks. You know, Tra a track is a metronome. Yeah. You know, in fact, I have a, a new book out. It's a rudimental book with 25 lessons on it, and every exercise in A2 in the book has a track. And it's set to seven different tempos. Mm -hmm. So you're just speeding, you know. And it's basically listening. They don't realize it because they're like, oh, this is cool. You mean a track designed for a track practice? designed for that exercise. Oh, I see. Okay. I thought you mean like just like like recordings of. of no, no, no. I put just... MIDI. It's mostly MIDI oh, I see. stuff okay. that I've done. And yeah. it's 25 lessons, and each lesson is in a different style of music. Mm -hmm. So, like, especially high school. Actually, I have all my college students listen to it too, but they, you know, one one section is like tango, so they they don't know what tango is, but right. after they get through it, at least they've heard it. Yeah, here we you know, And then they do it, and then they're playing along with these tracks. Or one section is all steel band music, one sex is salsa, one's disco, one's mm -hmm. rock and roll. You know, American <laughs> music too. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's all playing with a track, and mm -hmm. you know. But I also, um, you know, when I see with a lot of drum lines these days, they overuse the metronome. Hmm. They start to sound like a machine, so mm -hmm. you don't want to sound like a machine. That's the, that's like you, you know you're talking about somebody who doesn't have a good time. Mm -hmm. You know you work with a metronome, but if you work with a metronome too much, mm -hmm. you start to sound like a metronome. Yeah, like qu everything's quantized. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, have you talking about those Brazilian triplets? You know, yeah, you can't you can't play them. To a metronome, really. If you have a metronome on eight notes. What about if you're in the studio and you have you ever have to play to a click track? Oh sure, you know, sure. That's sure. gotta be. Uh, I know Ricky's really great at that. You know. But, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I, you know, I used to practice when I was in the New York. You know, I used to practice a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a I used lot, to practice like four a lot. five hours a day. Huh. I would the end of my practice session would always be playing with tracks. That with I had tracks. Three recorded tracks. And I, I wouldn't have a click on it. I would use a couple of percussion instruments instead of a click, but no drums. So, and that was, for me, that was the most fun part of my practice session, and that's what helped me get my time really to go. Yeah. But isn't it, I think it comes down to just playing with people because, you know, we're, we're talking about Western technology. I mean, if, if you go, you know, to West Africa. Yeah, they don't have, they don't have click tracks, but, they have. Yeah, I think just time. playing a lot. They have way better time than you yeah. know most of us. You're absolutely yeah, right. it, it depends on which people. I mean, I wouldn't That's want true. to play a lot with people with bad time, right? Because then your time's gonna <laughs> suck too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to get with people that have great sense of time for sure. But they definitely have like a oral tradition that just gets passed down, and it's it's really innate. Yeah, you know, there, their time. There, you, there's something to be said about that. You're yeah. right. Like, and when I go to Trinidad. And uh, the guys there, everything's done orally. It's all by rote. There's no music. You go, you go compete. You, they teach you the music all by ear. Mm. It was just like, man, it was nerve wracking. Mm. Can you write that down? Well, I don't even know how to write music. I'm not writing that. <laughs> right. Why, why so. is still playing Reese Reese so much? Huh? Why is still playing Reese so much? Because we just do a lot of literature. We just have a lot of literature. Just a lot of. It's like an orchestra. Yeah, he's not saying that steel pan players in particular read. No, actually, steel pan players from Trinidad can't read at all. Is that <laughs> you know, it's all by rote. It's just a cultural thing. You know? Like any other ensemble reads. But uh, their timing is really impeccable. You know, you can tell. Like, um, I was down there with Robbie Greenwich, and I was playing in his band. He's a pan player. You've heard of, heard of Jimmy Buffett. Yeah. He's a, he's a steel pan player for Jimmy Buffett, but he's... He's one of the best jazz pan players I've ever heard. 
and uh, just an incredible player. I was down there with his band and uh, Robbie Greenwich and Ralph McDonald, one of the most recorded percussionists of all time, Ralph McDonald. But he, Ralph died a few years ago. But I was down there, it was about 10 years ago, and with them, and uh, everything was by rope. And I remember him doing this. We were playing this piece, and he, and he looked at drum and he goes, what, what's the tempo? What was the tempo? He goes, 114. He goes, 114 beats per minute. He goes, we need to play it at 115. I'm like going, what? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? I said, you're joking, right? He said, no, let's bump it up to 115. Oh. <laughs> so he starts playing, and it's just that much faster, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm like going, how do you <laughs> Nobody had a metronome. No one had a metronome. But he knew exactly. Because, yeah, we need to play it at 115. Uh. I thought at first, that's a joke, right? That's a joke. That's, you're kidding. Mm -hmm. No, and these guys play. It was it was funny. They, not not only that, their their ears are, are just so good. There's this one guy who played in the double second section. He you sing anything to him, and people were saying he had perfect pitch. So you sing a pitch, you know, and he'd play it, you know, without just boom. That's that pitch. And I said okay. So I played the beginning of some skunk funk. I sang that. I said play this. He goes sing it again. I sang it twice, and he goes, Digga 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 I want that's so. kind of like a. It's probably they're a kind of related. In the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that. I wonder if that's really a good thing to have. Like perfect time. You can like because the way that different styles of music relate to time feel. And yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. That's what I said. It's probably a curse. I think having perfect pitch sometimes might be a curse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then so you, you try to modulate. You can't enjoy it. Yeah. You got perfect. You got curse. You know what bothers me? It's not. You think that ain't flat, don't you? That doesn't bother me. <laughs> that's my bad note. That's my note. That's uh, my. That's my <laughs> you put the hammer. That doesn't out. bother me so much. You know what drives me crazy? If I go in a uh, place and hear a band with a singer, and they ch they playing a song I know, and they change the key for the singer. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no key. I, I gotta leave. Wow. I can't. Because wow. yeah. you change the key, it changed the whole mood. You know? that's, that's funny because, you know, uh, Alan Toussaint, you know, composer, he would write songs and for a singer, you know, he'd write them in specific keys, you know, and if it didn't work for the singer, she would say or he would say or whatever, can we do it in a different key? Oh, no, no, let's just, let's just do this song over here. Right. You, know, and I, you know, I can understand that. If you're a composer and you write, it's like, you know, Doing a, a Debussy piece or something like that, doing it up a ass step or something like that, you know, transposing it. Whatever. <laughs> it was written for that particular key, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it sounds it sounds funny when you when when you when it you. It feels different, you know. It's yeah, a yeah. Different uh, feeling, different mm -hmm. mood. I mean, the Greeks correlated every key right. with a, a, an emotion, even right, and sure. a color. And I used to think they were right. crazy, but I, I understand a yeah. little better now. I mean, they're absolutely. Yeah. There are people that see color yeah. mm -hmm. when they hear music. You know, there's a color. And yeah, that's what they describe as a color. And, they, and, you know, I think for somebody to change the key of a piece of music totally is like, you you, uh, you know, a key, a certain key is is related to the range of notes as well. So right, it's, right. it's like if you, if you transpose it now, you have to transpose it up or down according to the range of the instrument it's on. And that affects the way intervals relate to each other. It just, like, completely... Changes the piece. It reminds me, I'm going to, um, a piece that we're playing tonight called Party Time. This is a Robbie Greenwich scene. Robbie sent me, he came and visited Southern Miss as a guest artist, and he sent me this tune, and it's an F sharp. He just leads, sends me a lead sheet. I had to do the arrangement. I said, but man, I said, you mind if I arrange it in F? I said, because my guy's just F sharp. That's, that's a brutal key for them to read in. It's just hard for them. He goes, he goes, F. That's a pretty key. <laughs> that was his response. <laughs> That's a pretty key. Yeah. What? <laughs> so so we do it in F. It said that. Uh, Thank you. 
Nice, man. But yeah, that's a feel we're going to play tonight. What is it called? Party time. Party time. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting what you say about the key. I, we, in my class, we were just we were uh, uh, talking about cycle tunes based on tunes based on cycles. Probably the, the more difficult one is the one that uh, Bill Evans composed called Comrade Conrad, and it's a it's a sixteen bar cycle and it goes through all twelve keys. You know, but and I used to play with Rick, my friend, my Rick Margitza. He would write songs based upon cycles. And what he told me is that you know it gets confusing to try to figure out what key you're in. But the more you do these things. The keys start to bring, you know, you start to recognize the keys by the colors, or you know, they start. They have a certain sound to a key, like a key of F or a key of A flat, or you know, the sharp keys have a certain sound to them, or whatever, sure. you know. Um, but that's a good way. It's like chords have like, a certain sound, you can tell. Right. You know, the more you play two five ones and you hear that major six, you go, oh, mm -hmm. I know that, man, I know that. Chord. Right. right. Cool. So, yeah. But as a, as a working musician, I mean, you're forced to, you have to know certain songs in every key. Because, you know, if you work with a singer, it's just, that's just how it goes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I started practicing that way well, a couple years ago. Well, fortunately, I don't. You know? Because <laughs> I am the singer. <laughs> right. So I learn it in the key that I know it. I mean, to, mock, to, to transpose tunes on this instrument is not easy. Uh -huh. You know, and I have to spend time at it. And I'm still, I mean, I'm really, in my opinion, I'm, 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 I got a long way to go on this instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's different. Certain tunes are, certain tunes are harder to play on this instrument than sound vibraphone, and some are easier. Mm -hmm. So it's depending on what I'm doing. But transposing sometimes, it's like, ooh, okay, let me wrap my brain around that. It's not like, like on a keyboard, you can visualize a key, you see a pattern, and it just moves, you know, and you have yeah. those patterns. On this, it's totally, it's totally different. See, I, I'm, totally. I would say I'm more bothered by, like, if horn players change it from, like, if it's an E, and then it goes to E flat, because I play bass, and then I don't have a, I don't have a low E flat. Yeah. Unless I tune down, right, but then right. that doesn't sound good either. Right. So yeah, you know, they, they'll range. just like yeah. a lot of trumpet players will just go like, yeah, now it's an E flat, and it's like, oh man, you just got rid of like my best note. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. got rid of my roar, man. It could be like guitar players. I know you never do this. Yeah, right. Got a capo. Capo, right? right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cheating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay. Um, anything else? What's the capo? For a guitar. It's like a device that's going change, to change, change a key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically shifts the note. Yeah. You come from a, a musical family, right? Don't you? Did you, did you yeah, you, uh, pretty <coughs> musical. My brother little brother's playing with us tonight. Yeah. Uh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie's your brother? Mm -hmm. Charlie Wooten? Yeah, I, I know him pretty well. What does he play? He plays he's bass. bass. He plays with the Royal Southern Brotherhood right now. That's his main gig. Mm. With Cyril Neville and yeah, I used Devin to be. Almond. Ezo? Guitar player. Does he My, teach, Mike Ezo. Does he teach as well? Or is he, is he, is he uh, no, is his professional musician? No, he plays around here. Okay. And he's on tour with those guys okay. a yeah. lot of the year. Yeah, he's had a lot. I, mm -hmm. I used to live in Atlanta. Yeah, I used to play at like Northside Tavern all the time. Yeah, Northside Tavern. Tavern. I'd see him all I'd I'd go, I'd go play with him once in a while over there. Yeah, North Carolina. Charlie Wooten. Yeah, good bass player. But my other brothers all play instruments, but they're not music. You know, they're not working musicians. Mm -hmm. um, I, they're, I'm one of five boys. Did you come from? Were your parents musical? Or not really? No, no. no my uncle was. Mm -hmm. He's a pianist. Uh, my parents listened to music all the yeah. time, and we were from Lafayette, which mm -hmm. you know, South Louisiana. Is a, yeah. I mean. You have to be blind or right. deaf not to hear music. Yeah. You know, and it was always around, and we were in a great school program. It was at Como High School at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, the, we had a great jazz band program there. Mm -hmm. Actually, had three jazz bands mm -hmm. at a high school. That's incredible. Right. I know. The, you know, you know, you don't hear one jazz band at most high schools now. We yeah. had three. Yeah. You know, which is great. Um, yeah. But uh, so that. Yeah, and then I was around, you know, all the Zotico players. I hated that stuff when I was growing up. Me too. I hated it. <laughs> but did you ever come over to the university and 
and Buckwheat Zydeco, and yeah. they'd be looking for drummers, and I'd, I'd hide. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> had two beats. <laughs> that was all you did all night long. Two speeds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I said, I don't want to play that crap. And then about, you know, this was in the early 80s. And then about the mid, mid 80s, if y'all remember, Cajun culture went, mm. it blew up. It was like those guys were like world famous mm -hmm. overnight. I'm not sure why. You understand why that happened? Mm -hmm. But the Cajun culture, like in the late Me 80s, <laughs> mid 80s, just blew up. Yeah. And like uh, Buckwheat Zotico was like, you know, winning Grammys now. Yeah. And he was a guy that played in the, you know, that shitty club down that street. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> now he's, it's weird. It's all marketing. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, see, it's kind of like the rest of the country discovered that pocket in the 80s. Yeah. And it became cool. Yep. Cajun food. Everything was blackened. You go anywhere in the country, we got blackened. It's Cajun. It's blackened. I said, just because you burned it, don't mean it's Cajun. <laughs> 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 Hattiesburg seems like a kind of interesting city, man, to me. I don't know, you know, you don't think of like Mississippi as being any, I don't know, there seems to be like a nice cultural thing happening there. There is. There they, really they have is. like uh, some places to play jazz there? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirsty Hippo. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, I played with the Astro We played Project there last week. Yeah, Astro yeah, yeah. Projects played there. Right, right. Um, it is, it's, it is happening. It's kind of a hippie city. Right, right. You got that hippie vibe going. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah, Of course, it's a university. There's a lot of fraternities. So, and it's a it's a, a huge liberal arts school mm -hmm. at the university. So, there's a lot of hippie professors. Right. Who have hippie kids. Right. You know. So there's you know, and they're from all over the world. Right. So you got people from all over the world there. It's not. Yeah. It's not Mississippi. Yeah. It really. Is. Yeah, I know. It's 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 it's. it's very it's unlike the rest of the Mississippi, the state. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I tell people, you, know, you want to go to Mississippi, go to North Mississippi. Yeah, that's that, Mississippi. That's that is very yeah, yeah. South Mississippi. It's, it's only an hour, and about an hour and a half drive from here. Yeah. I don't know. Have you ever been to Kiln? Kiln? Yeah, I can't well. Yeah, I've been to Kiln. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's kind of been through there. Yeah, Brett Farr's hometown. Yeah, you need a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> a haircut boy. Yeah, yeah, that kind yeah. of. And then there's Cuba. That's how they say it anyway. It's Cuba. Oh, Cuba. 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 <laughs> going over to Cuba. <laughs> how do you spell that? Oh, Cuba. I would have never guessed. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Well, tell us about your gig tonight, man. I mean, you know, I, I know you're playing tonight at Snug. Uh, yeah. Who's in the band? What you playing? And then uh, uh, Rich Mark. is playing yeah. um, drums. Uh, my little brother's playing bass. And Sam Bruton. Do you know Sam? No, I don't. You need to get to know Sam. He's okay. a great keyboard player. Oh, okay. He's a psychology professor. And <laughs> uh, uh, not, yeah, psychology professor at uh, Southern Miss. Mm -hmm. But he's like the baddest jazz pianist wow. in town. You know, mm -hmm. and he's a great composer. We're doing a lot of his tunes. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a great player. So he's, uh, so he's coming in to do that. And then but he quartet. needs to work on how to write yeah. his rhythms. But, <laughs> so we look so a couple charged. of charts today, rehearse on like. <laughs> well, he, so you need, to, you need to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing is, his mind works so fast, he writes things down, and, and then he's done with it. And then I, you know, I have to correct it. But, uh, so, no, I'm sorry, that's like a philosophy. He's a philosophy professor, not psychiatrist. It's like, yeah. Uh, so he philosophizes. He's mm -hmm. rude. Yeah. <laughs> and tomorrow night you're at the sandbar playing sandbar. the thing, and uh, you can yeah. play over it. I guess y'all can rehearse later a little bit. Yeah. 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 And then, and then, um, uh, then Thursday, the Steel Band will be at Jackson Square at 11.30. Wow. And then we're playing at NOCA at 2.30. The whole band? The whole group. Wow. 20-something, 20 28 pieces. Jesus. Right, yeah. And then at Brother Martin at 11 o'clock on Friday. Wow. Where's the group at now? That's in Hattiesburg. I left them. <laughs> my students. All my students. Who's driving the truck? <laughs> what's, what's cool is I got, I got seven grad students. Okay. So wow. I'm putting them in charge. All right. Yeah. That's great. Uh -huh, that's good. So, yeah. Cool. Great. So, uh, you playing tonight snog? Anything else we should, uh, before we wrap things up today? Or, uh, um, you got anything else you want to add to what you already added? No. Y'all want to play a tune? Yeah, sure. Wait, it's 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'll, Steve, I'll play something. Can I get yeah, a guitar? Sure. Let me go. Let me go. Andrew, bass. You got a bass player? Yeah, yeah we, we do. Right? Good. You agree with it? <laughs> I think we're gonna play something. E, we're gonna play something E flat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I'm gonna play. <laughs> <laughs> I tune them about every six months to a year. Depends. Sometimes if I drop them, of course I got to tune them right away. But, but um, when they were brand new, I had to get them tuned quite often. Yeah. You think you uh, got to break them in? Yeah, like yeah. Them. And then they, they actually, the older they are, they, they hold their pitch better. Wow. And they're actually steel? Yeah. Steel. It's chrome. These are chrome. Mm -hmm. We have painted ones, which got a little. Root. More of a raw sound to it, and then we have to have what we call raw, which are just no paint, no chrome, just metal. Get a little rust on it, so it's yeah. funky. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hey, one more thing. We talked about timing. Yeah. Timing and stuff. Yeah. Did you notice that it started to feel better when y'all started moving your feet? Yeah. Uh, it felt, the, the whole groove felt yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. standing here doing this as opposed to feeling the tempo and everything from head to toe. It helps. So if you ever need to, if you like, I need to get this, I need to get in this groove better. How do you play the triangle? This is just a. This is like a Brazilian triangle. That's the widest triangle. Well, it's, it's perfect. For, it's it's made for rhythm. It's a rhythm triangle because it's because it's wide like this. You can play up and down this way. You just hold it with your finger right here. All right. I never bring this to orchestra or anything. <laughs> this, is, this is meant for, you know, samba band or steel band. Uh, that's what, you mind show me the notes? Sure. This is a low E. And this is an F. This is an F? Yeah. So we need to Some of the, some, when you hear when you hear if it's higher pitch and you hear a ton of notes like uh -huh. just flying around, right. the lead pan players can play a lot faster I see. than I can play. Right. I got, I got a further I got further reach. Okay. But you can play chords really nicely. Exactly. Right. I can play pictures and all the really stuff. Isn't that what Narelle plays? Seconds most of the time when he plays a uh, lead as well, but he normally. We're going to do a couple of the rail tunes tonight. Oh, okay. They came through our previous school. Yeah. Where is that? Uh, oh, my niece. Yeah. Oh, Lonnie. 